Yesterday, I made a campfire in my backyard. This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. They have a terrific lineup of live courses you can attend either online or in person. They also have a terrific backlog of courses you can watch, including JavaScript The Good Parts, Build Web Applications with Node.js, AngularJS in depth, and Advanced JavaScript. You can go check them out at frontendmasters.com. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $1,000 bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the JavaScript Jabber link, you'll get a $2,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Let's face it, bookkeeping is hard, and it's not really what you're good at anyway. Bench.co is the online bookkeeping service that pairs you with a team of dedicated bookkeepers who use simple, elegant software to do your bookkeeping for you. Check it out at bench.co slash JavaScript Jabber for 20% off today. They focus on what matters most, and that's why they're there. Once again, that's bench.co slash JavaScript Jabber. This episode is sponsored by Wrangle.io. Wrangle's been working with Angular 2 for a long time, and they are now putting together an eight-hour, two-day course designed to help Angular developers learn how to write apps in Angular 2. If you're looking to level up your JavaScript and Angular 2 skills, then go to wrangle.io slash training and click on the link for Angular 2 training. If you're looking for other training in React or JavaScript, they also have that available at wrangle.io slash training. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 218 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Amy Knight. Hello. AJ O'Neill. I think I'm here, yeah? Coming at you live from Pleasant Grove. Dave Smith. Yoo-hoo. Jameson Dance. Hey, friends. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Quick shout-out about Newbies Remote Conf, which will be held in July. We also have a special guest this week, and that is Yehuda Katz. Hello. Now, Yehuda, you were one of the original panelists on this show, but we haven't had you on for a while. Do you want to just remind everybody who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, a lot of things, but mostly open source stuff, open standard stuff. I would say the big picture is I want programming to be a better, more hospitable place for more people, and I do a lot of things to try to make that happen. Uh, I also run a company called Tilda, which has a product called Skylight, which has been an enjoyable thing for me to be doing for the past five years or so. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. I'm sure we'll get into it. Yeah, I, I remember, I think the first time I met you was at a Ruby conference, and you were talking about Rails. Uh, you were pretty instrumental in Rails 3. And then a while later, you and uh, Tom Dale got together and did Ember. Yep. Yeah, that's true. I, a big. So there has been a... a I guess you guys can put things in the show notes, but uh, there was this thing by Peter Solnick recently about why I'm leaving Rails, and there was a recent follow-up about the purpose of abstractions and frameworks or something like that, that I thought was actually a pretty good capstone of the last, however, eight years of my personal life. Because a big part of what I did with Merb and then Rails and then Ember has been trying to figure out how to make frameworks that don't have all the drawbacks that people normally associate with frameworks. Have you made a lot of headway there? Because it seems like a lot of the problems are pretty common. Uh, I would say I've made a lot of headway, but a lot of the difficulty... So n not me personally, of course, there's a lot of people working on various things, various attacks. But a lot of the problems have to do with the fact that frameworks, by their very nature, are trying to make it so that people who don't already know the problem are able to solve it. Right? So by definition, if you use a framework like Rails or Ember or something like that, there's a whole bunch of problems in the problem space that you don't already know what the answers are, and you want to use a framework so that you don't have to think about them. Or whether or not you should, as a more like people say morally, you should learn it. It's a good thing. And I don't think anybody's going to dispute whether or not it's a good thing to learn things. But as a practical matter, people have apps to ship. People are building things. They're building products for the most part. And uh, it's not super trivial for people to just stop the universe and learn all of the things. Right? So by their very nature, frameworks are uh, trying to make it so that people can be productive building applications without having to know all the things. And what that means is that there's going to be some design decisions in the framework 
that don't necessarily match exactly what you would have expected because of the fact that they're hiding parts of the problem space that you haven't learned yet, right? So I would say most people, once they've learned the whole problem space, are usually able to look at these sort of weird edges and say, oh, of course, I see why that works that way. But people who haven't learned the problem yet often will look at frameworks and say, this is too magic, quote unquote. And I guess my feeling in general is that the most recent blog post that Peter Solnick wrote, which was basically saying the right answer is to build an opinionated layer on top that's built on top of composed uh, nice little primitives underneath it. I think that's roughly the right way to do it. And it's just a project to do it right. So... I think that sounds good when you say the weird edge cases kind of make sense as you learn more, but I'm having trouble thinking of a specific case. And this is totally putting it on the spot, but do you have an example of something like that? I can give a really concrete example that every framework that still exists today and is popular agrees with, but was some was controversial in the past. And that is batching DOM updates. So the simplest way to build a framework is to do roughly the thing Backbone did, which is Anytime uh, you want to do anything, anytime you want to update anything, you just ask the component that is attached to a particular part of the screen to update itself, and it will just do that synchronously. And one of the nice things about that model is that if something goes wrong, the debugger will be stopped right at the point where something went wrong. And so you can always, you always know when I call this component.render, I'm doing that manually, and immediately upon calling it, it will render, and I'll see the update and happen synchronously, and I get exceptions and all that. The problem with that is that it's possible for, first of all, it's possible to have contained components. So you have a component that contains other components. And in all of modern frameworks, that's largely how it works. Uh, in Backbone, people tried to do it, but it was a project sometimes. But second of all, uh, you may have one component that gets updated multiple times because maybe it has inputs from multiple different uh, sources, right? And so you would really like is you would really like for any, for any given user interaction, when a user clicks on a button, you would really like it so that every piece of DOM is only touched at most once and zero times if that is correct. So for example, if I remove a component from the screen and at the same time the input of some child component gets updated, I would like that child component to get updated touched zero times because it was removed, right? And in order to do all that, again, every single framework, Ember, React, Angular, Aurelia, uh, all the frameworks that are rel- like came out since 2011 or 2012, all do that today. Uh, in Angular, the thing that does it is called the digest loop. In Ember, the thing that does it is called the run loop. Uh, Angular 2 has this thing called zones, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of techniques for doing it. But at the end of the day, everybody agrees now that it is, the correct thing is to make sure that you aren't updating the DOM a lot of times per user interaction. And the way to accomplish that is to make users go through an abstraction layer for DOM. So instead of you can just touch the DOM willy-nilly whenever you want, there are specific points in time where you're supposed to touch the DOM. There are specific ways in, you're supposed to, in which you're supposed to interact with it. And in Ember, Angular, and React, the way you're supposed to interact with the DOM, by and large, is declaratively, right? So using a templating engine that is designed to work together with your uh, framework. And in case you want to say React is not a templating engine, that's not interesting. That's not interestingly related to what I'm saying. Uh, I just mean the way that you write the markup is not just a bunch of jQuery, and it is tightly integrated with the framework. And the benefit of that is that you could, the framework guarantees you that a piece of DOM is only touched one time per user interaction. So that's an example of something that where the, I mean, Jeremy argued with me that the backbone strategy is a lot simpler and it's simpler in one sense, in the sense that it's easy to understand. But in terms of what guarantees you get when you write a bigger program, it's actually much more complex. You're saying there's all these things that if you were just writing code from scratch yourself with a naive understanding of the problem, you wouldn't do, and then it would bite you later, and these frameworks help avoid it ahead of time, right? Right, and, and it's a combination of things like security and uh, performance, where maybe if you knew it, the space very, very well, you'd be able to do the right thing and things where it's almost impossible to do it correctly without a God's eye view of the whole program, right? So Ember, Angular, React all manage the DOM for you because without a God's eye view of the whole program, there's actually no way to guarantee the thing I just said. Sure. It's also the case that I said I used Ember, Angular, and React in this example because it's since everyone agrees to it, you cannot really debate whether it's a good idea or not at the same level as other things. But Ember's general philosophy is to take that idea and to apply it to more cases like how a startup works, where your state is supposed to go, um, sort of like the way Redux guarantees that your state goes into a particular place, Ember guarantees that your state goes into a particular place, uh, has a story for add-ons for the build system. So for example, if you have an emoji add-on, 
you actually really need it to be the case that the images for the emoji add-on end up in your in your production payload, and that's something also that Ember takes care of, right? So there's all these things that just by using Ember you get the right behavior, and all the the reasons for that are just trying to solve problems that are very common in a way that composes. So if you write a big program, you don't have to necessarily know all the details because if you were required to know all of them, you would have messed up somewhere along the way, and the whole program wouldn't have done the right thing. So I have a question that's uh, vaguely related to that. One of the things that I notice about Ember is that it seems like you place a lot of emphasis on creating these these kind of like atomic chunks of stuff and giving them names and then talking about them like that. So you talk about Glimmer and Fast Food and oh, there's another one that I can't remember. Services is another really good example of this where we took a lot of energy to make a name for something that is pretty humdrum concept to begin with. Yeah, what do you see the role of, and, and that almost seems like, uh, I mean, there's a ton of technical work that goes into implementing all that stuff, but then there's also this kind of layer of marketing on top of it. Can you talk about how those two things interact in Ember? Sure. So I, I think I wouldn't call it marketing. Well, yeah, uh, marketing kind of sounds like a dirty word, but but it's well, clear that there's effort to give good names to, to things. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't dislike the term marketing. I think people shouldn't dislike marketing. I think people who do marketing work do good work, and we should respect them for that. But I'm I'm actually saying a different point than that which is part of the reason why we have names like fast food and services and Glimmer is to make it easy for the entire ecosystem to always be talking about the same thing. So you, uh, a lot of other frameworks have concepts that everyone talks about all the time. A good example of this would be in React, context is a thing that almost every other framework built on top of React or every collection of things built on top of React has to think about. But React itself doesn't really uh, try to make it a concept that a lot of users understand or know about or has a coherent foundation. And that means that it's very difficult for like Redux and React Router to talk to each other about what's happening, even though conceptually they're not necessarily particularly overlapping. They're solving different problems. It's just that the core foundation doesn't have a, a, doesn't have a good uh, set of terminology around it. And React actually does a really good job like React did a better job than Ember did forever at talking about state in, the, in this way, right? And state management and data flow, things like that, that. I think they did a great job at naming a bunch of things. And Ember, of course, liked a lot of the stuff that React did and tried to uh, reuse some of the naming or come up with our own where it made sense. An example of this would be data down actions up, right? It was a, a thing that React has as a concept that we gave a name to. But I think Ember in general really wants the ecosystem to know how to talk about things. So we want people to, when people say fast food, they mean a particular thing. They don't just mean server-side rendering, but they mean you know server-side rendering where you can you boot up the application once and you run things concurrently and it's part of a larger initiative to improve the boot time performance of Ember and things like that. And I think that's valuable in terms of getting the ecosystem on the same page and making sure that all the add-ons in the world uh, so we have you know a few thousand add-ons. Make sure all the add-ons are also talking about roughly the same thing. Sure, that makes sense. I yeah, it's just it's fascinating to me because it's again like you said, it's so different from the model in React where it's kind of like just this hive of people all kind of yelling at each other, and then eventually some name kind of bubbles up and people start using it. And with Ember, it seems like there's just a lot of deliberate effort to give people a handle to talk about and think about. Yeah, and certainly I think it's it should be clear, and this is also true about the Rust project, which I'm a part of, I don't think it makes sense for the core team to just come up with a bunch of names and put our stamp on it. We have a pretty involved RFC process, which now has a section called How Should We Teach It, uh, which gets a lot of community input, like you know hundreds or thousands of responses sometimes to some of these RFCs. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a lot of people using these tools and they have, might have a perspective on what the right name is, or uh, you know, somebody may say, well, that's a cool name, but you know, .NET already uses that exact same name for something else, so you should consider not using it. <laughs> and that may not necessarily be something that I come up with on my own, right? So I think sure. uh, it's still, I would say, somewhat of a, it's a, I think deliberate is the right word. It's a deliberative process. It's not a top-down process, really, but it's a very deliberative process. And the part of the reason for that is that tools like Ember are around for a long time. And part of the way that we avoid them getting stale and crusty is by making sure we write down our deliberations so that we could come back in a year or two and say, hmm, I wonder why we did that. What was the reason why we came up with that idea? And if we have we've done a good job of, of writing down what we did, it's easier to go back in a year or two and say, oh, well, the reason we did that was that I8 did this or that thing, and I8 we don't care about it anymore, so we can revisit that question. So would you say that this is a function of making it easier for the community and teams to communicate? It just, 
Uh, let me frame it a different way. It, it seems like it's something that would then affect the way that the community talks to each other. Is, is that one of the goals, or is that kind of a secondary effect? I would say that's probably the main goal. Programming in general is a, I mean, this is a cliche, but it's a tool for humans to communicate with each other. It's not really about communicating with the machine. Communicating with the machine is easy. And since it's a, a tool for humans to communicate with each other, and I personally lived through a bunch of pretty bad experiences around primitives that were just fine but had didn't allow humans to communicate well enough, I sort of got from Rails the idea that we could create named concepts. So some people think that it's not a good thing that Rails makes these named concepts because what if you don't? What if your program doesn't fit into one of the buckets? And I think Rails could have a few more certainly, and that's why we have services. But I think by and large, we have to understand that people are spending most of their day every day writing applications, making products, right? So like for example, I, I don't spend most of my time working on Ember. I spend most of my time working on Skylight. And when I'm working on Skylight, I have to spend time thinking about, you know, when a user clicks on sign up and they actually already signed up, what is the right answer for that? And that is itself a pretty hard question. I mean, that's one of a million questions I have to ask. And I just don't have time for that much primitive thinking, right? I, I really do need there to already be high level concepts that say the right answer for this is a component, the right answer for this is a service, the right answer for this is a route. Um, and when I have those, and obviously it's not, I don't, I'm not saying that because I personally uh, don't know how to do that since you can observe that I make the framework. So obviously I could have done that myself, but when I'm working on Skylight, I really prefer to be working on, uh, to be thinking about the product. And I don't know, I guess a lot of people, it seems like a lot of people really enjoy working on products and also you know, thinking a lot about functional programming at the same time. And I, I don't, maybe my brain is not big enough for that. Makes yeah, sense you, to me. It also seemed like a lot of people wanted me to say things about decorators on Twitter. Do you have feelings about decorators, Yehuda? I do. Uh, so the, I can give you a status update basically. So decorators are now, it's like the oldest, uh, not yet six feature in the sense that I submitted the first proposal a very long time ago, a couple of years ago now. It's a big feature. So the biggest, the reason that decorators exist is because in ES5, classes were just POJOs that had expressions in them. And so if you wanted to do things that are like decorators, you could just have written a function that takes a function and every, have a nice day. And that worked out okay. Ember does a lot of that. And in addition, in addition to Ember doing a lot of that, pretty much everyone does a lot of that uh, in some form or another. Uh, Ember does, maybe Ember does an aggressive amount of it, but every framework did more, some things in ES5, in their ES5 class systems that are not easily expressible in ES6. And the reason for that is that ES6 is a, what was called a max min uh, class system, which basically means that it's just a minimal, it's enough to get a consensus, but we really do need to iterate more on it. One of the things that you cannot easily do in ES5, but is like a nice thing to be able to do, is to be able to say this property is enumerable or not enumerable. This property is configurable or not configurable. This property is writable or not writable, right? Those things are quite difficult to do because those things are talking about the property descriptor, not the, the value. You can't wrap a function in a value that becomes a non-enumerable non property. It's a mismatch about the timing. So that's sort of the, the table setting. Uh, the idea behind decorators is instead of trying to figure out a solution for every combination, like, oh, we could have a non-enumerable keyword, we could have a con not configurable keyword, we could have a writable keyword, uh, we can try to do combos of these things. Why don't we just make a single system that allows you to say something about the properties and classes that you're creating? That was the decorator proposal. It's gone through a bunch of iterations over the couple, last couple of years. Uh, Babel and TypeScript implemented the first version, as probably listeners know. The feature is used in, in Angular 2 as a first-class thing. It's used in Aurelia, and the React and Ember communities use it quite a lot. So it's, it's a feature that's sort of been around as a way of closing a big gap in what the ES6 class system was able to express, uh, ES 2015, I should say. But it is also a feature that is controversial because it's basically adding back imperative semantics and met, like meta semantics, letting you talk about property descriptors into the middle of a highly declarative structure, right? A, a structure that was extremely static and now becomes highly dynamic. And so it's just been a controversial thing. The most recent version of the proposal tries to make the actual structure of it a lot very similar to the object at the find property API, and I'm pretty happy with it. And I should I should actually just post the slides uh, after this call. I should post them, and you guys can put them in the show notes the slides for the new the new version of the proposal. But I submitted spec text in, uh, at TC39 in Munich, and the committee asked me for more spec text, so I will have more spec text in 
Redmond, and I'm hopeful that at that point we can we can discuss it. There's definitely some debate uh, on the committee about the feature itself, but I think by and large, TypeScript and Babel and the tremendous amount of usage in the ecosystem has proven the feature out as a valuable feature. And we're going to have to, I mean, it's like anything else, we're going to have to work through on the committee what the we we'll have to work through some disagreements on the committee, but I think that's fine. I think the committee works well, so should be okay. So I wanted to back up and ask some questions about the community more because I just recently listened to uh, your first interview on the Code Newbie podcast, and you said a lot of really great things that I would love other people to hear that don't listen to that. So my question is kind of two part. On the show, you talked about why you're not crazy about the term junior developer, and then you also talked about this curse of knowledge bias. And I think it also goes along with you know what we're talking about technically with how you approach building Ember. So I really just kind of wanted you to you know expand on those things a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can reiterate. I would definitely recommend that people listen to that podcast because I probably will not be able to go into as much detail here as I did there. And I thought it was, I thought I did a, a reasonable job of explaining my opinion, at least there. Saran was a great interviewer. I'll try to give the, the high order bits here. So the reason I'm not in love with the word junior, uh, the term junior is because it implies that there's a set of skills that everybody should think about as being the skills that you need to be a programmer. And then you can rank them in ranked order. So you can look at a programmer and say, this programmer is a junior programmer or a senior programmer uh, based on how much skill they have in a particular set of skills that we've decided are the important ones. But in fact, almost everybody, like if you're not working uh, at like Google's search team or something like that, like working on their algorithm, almost everybody is working on a product and products have a lot of requirements. So even just from, from the implementation perspective, there are people who work on, you know, some like algorithmic things and I think even if I said this also in the other podcast, I think in practice, the algorithmic things end up being relatively rare, even for people like me who work on that kind of stuff a lot. But if you hit a problem that is best solved using computer science and you choose not to over and over and over again, my experience is that the, your code base ends up being harder to maintain. Again, we're talking about 1% of the time, right? We're talking about a very tiny percent of the time, but if you don't, if you don't do it thoughtfully, I think that doesn't end up with, that ends up producing bad code base. So that's one aspect is uh, computer science. But of course, there's all these other things like, one thing I noticed uh, when I was a designer in college, not a web designer, but a print designer, is that a lot of people would make college newspapers and they take their text and the text is not actually, there's no padding between the line, the border and the text. And I always looked at that and I said, how is it possible that you're, you've put that on a, on a piece of paper and you didn't notice that that was happening by the time it got to the piece of paper. Um, and there's just some people who are good at that, right? There are some people who can look at a, a circle and some text in it and say that is vertically aligned or there's enough padding between this box and this text. And there's some people who visually aren't good at that. And there's nothing wrong with that either, right? Um, there's also people who are really good at writing, people who are really good at expressing what's good about a product, people who are really good at talking to their friends about why the product is good, people who are good at Twitter. And these are all things that actually go into making an awesome product. And it's, it's not that the implementation aspects are the main thing and then being good at Twitter is like a secondary thing. It's actually just a combination of all these skills that make a product good. And typically there's not one person on the team who's good at all of them. Typically when you hire, and this is, this is what I was talking about, you want to try to find a mix of people who have the necessary skills. So if the way you approach hiring is step one, monotonically rank every single person who enters in terms of quote unquote programming skill. And then step two, try to pick the top person on that list. What's going to happen is you're going to end up producing a very homogenous group of people. And I don't, I, it is, it's true about homogenous from the diversity perspective, but it's also just true. It's also true from the functional perspective and there, these things probably overlap, right? So you end up producing a homogenous group of people with homogenous skills. And then unsurprisingly, a lot of products end up looking a lot like the implementation. It's quite common that you look at a UI and you say, I don't understand why this looks like this. And then if you're a programmer, you say, oh, that's because the database table is just sitting right here. And that's because they just didn't happen to hire somebody who was good at thinking about that. Or they hired like one person out of 10 and that person can't ever make headway convincing anybody else to care. So uh, that's why I don't like junior. I don't, I think there's maybe a sense in which Junior is a thing, but it's so much used to describe this. How what is your programming skill for some definition of programming skill that I find I just 
think it, it's counterproductive to use it as a, as a concept. And I, have, and I will admit that even I, when I find myself using that terminology, like I think a lot about this stuff when I hire. And when I find myself using the terminology, I find myself getting sucked into the same mistake. I just think the terminology leads people down a bad path. So that was part one, was junior. Uh, part two is cursive knowledge. So the thing about cursive knowledge is this is like a well-known bias. I'm not making it up. It's just like a thing. And what it means is that people who have a lot of experience with something don't have a lot of empathy for people who don't have it. And I don't mean that in like a fuzzy way. I mean, I mean empathy in the definitional sense and ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes, right? So if somebody files a bug on your project or you know, submits an intercom issue against your product, this is a thing they teach you when you're a customer service rep. I, I worked in a movie theater for like a couple of years in college getting paid very little money. But one of the things they taught us was how to be a customer service rep. When someone comes over to you, they gave us a stack of drink coupons and said, before anything happens, first try to give them a drink coupon and see if that makes them happy. And when you're a customer service rep, you learn this stuff. You learn what are the rules for dealing with upset people. And part of that is the, is a bunch of heuristics for trying to get to a point of empathy, um, or at least being able to pretend. And so the curse of knowledge is basically just a bias that causes people to not be able to empathize with people who are new. And it causes them to say things like, you know, I am an open source contributor doing this on my volunteer time. If you don't like it, go use somebody else's product. Or it causes people to say, sorry, this product is not for you, or this project is not for you. And th that may be true. There are cases where that's true. For example, if somebody tried to use Ember to build something that was a single component inside of an existing Rails application, I would say Ember is probably not for them. But it's usually not the case that Ember is not for you because you happen to not already know JavaScript or HTML or CSS or some other, or you happen to like Node or Go or something like that, right? And I think what ends up happening is that the curse of knowledge causes people to sit, instead of trying to empathize and say, the person who is submitting this bug or this file in this report is a human being who already uses my product by definition or they would not be filing a bug. And if they're having a problem, it probably comes from a real place and they're confused and I should probably try to understand where that's coming from. The curse of knowledge causes us to say, well, if they're not willing to put in the effort, you know, sorry. And uh, I can give an example from Rust. In Rust, I was the champion of the lifetime elision proposal, which uh, people should check out Rust for sure. But basically Rust is awesome because it has this concept of ownership which is the idea that uh, instead of a single object being owned by many other objects, it's always owned by one object at a time. And the way that that's represented in Rust is using these special annotations called lifetimes. And I wrote a proposal a while back that passed to say, let's eliminate like 90% of all those. We can infer them. And there was a, a bunch of people who said, all that's going to do is push back your, the when you have to learn it. And if you're not willing to learn it, you probably shouldn't be using Rust in the first place. And I said, no, I, people, you know, people want to use Rust because they're Ruby programmers who are trying to, you know, have a, they're trying to learn systems programming or something like that, and we should enable them. And we shouldn't necessarily tell people just because you're a Ruby programmer instead of a C++ programmer, you're not, you don't belong here. And yeah, I think cursive knowledge is an important thing. I think people should always, it's not like try to identify when you're having it, you're just always having it. You should, the thing to try to identify is the effects. Right, and and if you can if you can slow down and say if a person is filing a bug, if a person's confused, if a person's upset, if a person's angry, it's probably coming from a place of being frustrated about already liking your product, already using your product. I think that's good. Did that thank answer your question, Amy? Yes, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, I gave a much longer enumeration of this in the other podcast. People should definitely check it out. Yep, we'll add a link. Cool. Yeah, after that podcast, by the way, I was thinking a lot about it, and I was thinking a lot about the fact that a lot of the things I said on the podcast seem pretty obvious to me, but the terminology that we use in tech causes us to think about things the wrong way. And I, I don't know, I don't have anything new on the topic except to say, I think it's probably, I don't know, I don't 